Hello, everyone. Guten Morgen. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I want to welcome everyone and introduce myself. My name is Lucy Patterson, and I am an educational liaison officer here at the Goethe Institute in New York. Uh, we are very honored today to host uh, Inga Auerbacher here at the Goethe Institute to learn more about her lived experience and to be able to engage in a very meaningful conversation with her. We will start. We will start with a welcome and few words from the director of the Goethe Institute in New York, Jörg Schumacher. And then we are very happy that Stephen Smith, the chief executive officer of StoryFile, is able to join us today uh, virtually from California to give us an introduction into a VR and browser-based experience called Tell Me Inga and provide us with a little background uh, and context to his work that he has completed with Inga Auerbacher. Following, we will invite Inga Auerbacher herself up to give us a presentation of her life journey through pictures. To conclude the hybrid event, there will be a Q&A session where Inga will answer questions that students and teachers have submitted in advance. For our guests who are here with us in person today, we will then have a reception following. Now, I would like to welcome the director of the Goethe Institute New York, York Schumacher, to the stage. Thank you, Lucy. Good morning and a warm welcome also from my side. My name is Jörg Schumacher. And it is truly an honor to welcome Inga Auerbacher here at the Goethe Institute in New York. I'm very happy, a second, I'm very proud that you're going to share your life story, a second, also with a group of students here at the Goethe Institute in New York and many others, a second, um, uh, on, on Zoom um, online, a second, this session. Um, in addition to the guests from the schools of um, uh, Eunice School and the Stuyvesant School uh, in Manhattan and also Brooklyn Tech, in Brooklyn, is like which I want to give a warm welcome here at the Goethe Institute. One of a few of the, the students is, I guess, still arriving, but it's like a, a, a warm welcome to everybody who's here. I would also uh, extend my welcome is like to the over 1,000 students of colleges um, and high schools that signed up uh, to follow this event online. That's an amazing number. I'm very happy that you tuned in. We do have registrations from all over the country, actually, including Boston, Michigan, Dallas, Texas, from Brown University in Rhode Island, from Princeton in New Jersey, uh, also including the Spark Lab, ESSEC, which is dear to us at the Goethe Institute, and the Partnerschule, the PASH schools, ESSEC, so also a warm welcome to all of them. In the name of the Goethe Institute, I would also like to thank our partners from Meta and StoryFile um, to let us implement the interactive VR experience into education context. For us, Tell me Inge is an innovative way to ensure that voices like Inge's, Inge's remain heard and available for generations to come. First-hand experiences such as this event are nevertheless 
invaluable. Inge is very passionate about telling her story and especially enjoys talking to students. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation in a couple of minutes. What is going to follow after this event? Uh, the Goethe Institute Bildungskooperation plans to develop further resources for German educators to implement this tool into their classrooms. One resource about how to implement Inge's personal story into the classrooms has already been developed by our German educational multipliers, GEMS. There will be a workshop offered on the following Tuesday, that's February 13th, to instruct educators on how to use this resource. Furthermore, a large educational training series concerning a wide, ver a wi a wide variety of anti-discrimination topics will continue throughout this year of 2024. Before handing it over to Stephen Smith, the Chief Executive Officer from Storyfile, allow me to thank my colleague Lucy Patterson um, for setting this event up. A warm welcome to Anne Schönhagen and a thanks to SEC for setting up the regional series. A thanks to all staff of Goethe Institute New York uh, for running this event. I see our uh, online course director, Eva. Um, a thanks to Mark, a sec, our technician. A thanks to Mike and Olivia um, and um, everyone involved a sec, in setting up this. We'll start now with a two minute trailer about the project followed with a welcome remark by Stephen Smith. Thank you so much. of my immediate family, my parents, my grandparents. Ask her about her terrible journey, life in a terrible concentration camp, how she experienced liberation there, and much more. Please will share testimony about the past, so in the future, she will be able to ask questions from the next generation and every generation after that. Good morning, uh, my name is Stephen Smith. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you all and thank you so much to the Goethe Institute for your partnership on this uh, wonderful project. Um, I'm Stephen today from California and it's a pleasure to be with you. Those of you who are physically and present in New York with Inga and those of you around the country. Inga, good morning. Um, I'm sorry I'm not with you. <laughs> but of course, it's always wonderful to uh, partner with you telling your story as we've been doing this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, um, today we're going to be hearing from Inga Auerbacher. You know, when we look back at history, we often refer to it through a sequence of dates and events and statistics. And we expect to uh, an experience like what happened during the Holocaust that tends to happen is those statistics just pile up in large numbers that are very difficult to understand in human life. That's why we're really honored today to have Inga with us because she is not only an eyewitness of the past, but she is also a participant in our present. And if we try to bridge the past with the present, 
the time is coming when it will be left to us, that is, the generation that has followed this history, to carry it forward. But India today is giving us the opportunity to cast a baton, a baton of history, but also a baton of her values. You know, she was one of very few people who are still there that survived the uh, ghetto and concentration camps that Sarah was uh, that was in. And she carries the memory, not only of her own family and those that were lost, and the three years of incarceration, but also the memory of all of those children that did not survive, including her friend Ruth. The memory that we carry, and that she carries, is one that is being passed to us. And the best way that we can do that is to make it personal, to come heart to heart, mind to mind, and to learn from one another. You know, it would have been so easy for Inga to live her life with anger and bitterness and hatred because of what happened to her and the consequences of it. But in fact, that's not how she has lived her life. She has lived her life with hope, bringing peace, and just every single day doing little things that add up to a lot. I've got to know Inga now over a number of years and have uh, learned about her from her. One of the things that impresses me most about Inga is not that she turns up and gives talks at the, the Bundestag at the United Nations or now at the Goethe Institute, but the little things she does every day that you and I wouldn't ordinarily see the fact that she has neighbors who are Muslims and Sikhs and that she goes to the mosque and the, and the temple with them and that she celebrates their life journey with them. One of the things that we learned from the Holocaust is that it wasn't so much the big things that mattered, it was the little things, the relationships we have with one another. And I know today she'll be sharing that history with us, but I think she'll also be guiding us uh, in terms of how we think and how we learn. Um, Tony Inga is a virtual reality project. Uh, Inga Abaha was in a studio in New York um, about 18 months ago, and she answered many, many questions about her life. And now what you can do is go into the VR goggles, um, and you can sit with Inga and ask her questions. And as you ask her questions, the story of her life unfolds around you in beautiful animation. Of course, the beauty of the animations is deceptive because of the terrible story that she is telling. So I do urge you, please do go and spend some time uh, in telling Inga. You can watch it in VR. You can also watch it online at inga.storyfile.com. And you can then experience what it's like to listen to her stories in that virtual reality experience. Inga, I want to say to you thank you. Uh, for your inspiration. Thank you for being the person you are and for being here today. To complete my introduction to Inga, just to give you an idea of the kind of person you are about to meet, I would like to quote her from her talk in the Bundestag on Holocaust Memorial Day two years ago. She said the following, Hatred against all people is terrible. We are brothers, brothers and sisters. My greatest wish is reconciliation among all people. So light a candle today to remember the murder of innocent children, women, and men. Light a candle to celebrate life and hold back the darkness. Take care of your sisters and brothers. Then you will always be blessed. We are all born as children of God. The gates to unity and peace are open. The past must never be forgotten. And together, let us pray for unity on earth. Let us welcome a new tomorrow. And never lose sight of this dream. In the eye of our you really are a star. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you today to Inga Alba. Thank you so much, Stephen, for the amazing work that you and your team have accomplished in creating Tell Me Inga uh, and for making it so widely available and accessible for educational audiences and beyond. Uh, I also want to thank you for your support and collaboration in planning and creating this event today. 
uh, it was a very unique and special opportunity that we are now able to offer our educational networks. Uh, now I would like to welcome to the stage Inga Auerbacher. Uh, Inga, your willingness and desire to share your story, uh, especially with audiences such as this, comprised of students and educators, is truly extraordinary. So thank you very much. And uh, yes, please come and have a seat. And we will get started. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And, um, and thank you, Steve, for the wonderful introduction. And thank you, everybody here, all the wonderful people <coughs> who made this program possible. Too many names. I'm not good with names. And yeah, I know I couldn't be your grandmother. I just turned 89. <coughs> but I want to live at least 220 plus. <laughs> and I have many, many things in mind already. My seventh book will be uh, finished pretty soon, hopefully. And it's wonderful to see so many people here smiling. And it reminds me of my childhood, which was a little different from yours. I also still speak German. How many of you know German? Oh, great. Herzlich willkommen. Anyway, I am a village girl, and perhaps I still have that in my soul, a little village. I want to take you now on a journey of some of my life. My family dates back hundreds of years in Germany. Jewish people lived in Germany more than a thousand years. And what is it to be Jewish? Can somebody tell me? What is it to be Jewish? Just, what is it? Can somebody tell me? Or I'm just going to ask somebody. OK, you can tell me. Me? Yeah, why not? Um, what is it? To be human? Hmm? To be human? Not only human. It, no, we believe in the Old Testament. That's it. It's the only difference. And you know, Jesus was Jewish. Yeah. So I'm happy to, be, to have to understand and to read the one testament. And you people who are Christian, you have to do both. <laughs> so I'm happy with that. Um, it's very important to learn from other people. I've traveled the world all the way to Afghanistan, Pakistan. I've been to many mosques, many. I've been to many churches any religion. I live in Queens, New York, which is probably the most diverse place in the whole country. In fact, I just heard they're trying to get my street named after me. It's not done yet, but that would be my greatest wish. I live in Jamaica, Queens, one of the most diverse places in the whole country. My next door neighbor, the houses are attached. Um, is Muslim, very devout. He went to the Hajj, that every person should do, I believe only the men probably. Uh, he's done that, wall, wall to wall. Next wall is a family from British Guyana, they're Indians, very devout Hindus. And then there's a Christian family and others from different countries. So. That is uh, something I really treasure, if they will do it. It's only one block to have a, a whole uh, you know, block fest. Everybody should bring their own food. We got to live together. And the only way we can live together 
is to get to know each other. That's very important. And all these terrorists, I mean, this is just horrible in the whole world. And uh, we got to, like Stephen said, yes, I said in the Bundestag, the German parliament, we are all brothers and sisters. And that's how I want it to be. Now, I'm going to take you on a journey of my life <coughs> with pictures. Now, who's going to do the picture? Oh, you have it already. You know, I'm going to, I have a problem right now. I have a uh, herniated disc that was operated, and I don't walk so good because I've climbed already. I was in Afghanistan and all those mountains. I've done everything. I was in Moscow. I was all over, and all over Germany. Let's see. I, I, you know, I have to move it around a little bit so I can see what's on. Yeah, please sit. Okay. Uh, I'm also, by the way, a songwriter. I'm looking right now for a hip hop person. I have a great uh, a li lyric for something like that. A little, yeah, not you know, a little up to date. So if anybody can do that, ask me. <laughs> anyway, to me, the title of the book is "I'm a Star," my first one ever. And I'm turning this negative symbol, which I will show you later, the star, with the word Jew on it, turning it around to me. Every human being is a star. And when I speak, especially with younger children, when I leave the, you know, the place, the school, uh, they, they say, I am a star. I'm a, indeed, you are all stars. Every person has something to give to this world and is special. Next. I'm born in a little village in southwestern Germany, very near France and Switzerland, called Kippenheim, a village. And um, among them were 60 Jewish families Others were Christian. We got along very well with each other. And uh, it's still there. It looks just like that today. Here's the city hall. My family lived in that village about 300 years. They owned a house, which was about 300 years old, still there. In fact, I had company the other day from the granddaughter of the, uh, of the owners of the house. Now she came to see me. OK, next. And I was the last Jewish child born in this village. Here's our house, very big house. It had a courtyard in between. Uh, very, uh, I was born in, when you see the two windows at the end, that was my parents' bedroom, and I was born in that. Today, there is a plaque on the house. Well, the, that was there quite a while ago. Uh, but I, it never bothered me, uh, or I was not interested, but today I am. And then they put also a plaque that I was born there as well. Now the other one is, was a tailor who became very famous in England. They tell me that he made those black beaver hats, you know, the black hats. And he was knighted for doing good things in Germany. Uh, he built an orphanage in the Black Forest. It's very near the Black Forest, very near. And uh, so I would like to do a book one day, and he, uh, you know, of that he did a lot of good things. So I'm so happy to be born in a house where something, somebody really good was born, a good kind person. Next. I was born on December 31, 1934. Yes, I am 89. Young, young, don't forget. I may have a cane, but that's going to go be thrown away one of the uh, And my father was uh, a soldier in World War I. He was wounded and got the Iron Cross, like the, the Purple Heart here. And even when I wrote my first book, he said, am I in your book? He said, yes, your soldier picture's in there. He said, that's good. He was a proud German, very proud. We spoke German at home. I'm here in this country since 1946, and I still speak very good German. I can read and write it. 
In fact, I took a course of Goethe, uh, the Faust, which was very hard. I took German in college. I became a chemist for 38 years in medical research and clinical work. But my hobby was always writing, and now I also write many songs. One has even been sung in the United Nations by 65 children, of course, which is now my next book, hopefully comes out within a certain time. So here's the soldier. Here I am in my uh, sandbox. We had a big courtyard in the house, and uh, there was always a cat that came and messed up everything. So. Here I am in the Black Forest, uh, it's behind, and I'm wearing the famous dirndl dress. You know, what the little girl, German girls wore, or when you go in the restaurant, you see them with their apron. I was a real typical German little girl, and at that time, we had a certain hairdo. And they called it the toilet, and this hair up with a uh, little curl. And when I came to America, I stayed a few weeks with some relatives, and the daughter said, you have to get rid of that. You want to be an American now. You look too foreign. So then this went. And I had these, uh, my immediate family, uh, my mother and father, and my mother's parents, the other grandparents were not alive anymore. They had died young. So, and my grandmother gave me a doll when I was two years old. And I found out that the doll's name, original name, was Inga. My name, never knew that until I spoke in some schools. I named her after Marlene, Marlene Dietrich. Are you familiar with that? Very famous actress in Germany and in America. In fact, I visited her grave when I was in Germany. Uh, here was our beautiful synagogue, which was destroyed on November 9th and 10th, actually in, in Germany, uh, in our area, it was November 10th. And uh, all the synagogues in Germany and in also in uh, other countries like Austria and some parts in Bohemia, that was the start of the Holocaust. And here is the inside of it, which was, I have a piece here. Do I have enough time? I want to show you the piece from the inside of the synagogue. We call our churches synagogues. And here's a piece, original, from the inside. Can you see it? Of the wall. And uh, today it has been refurbished. In fact, they wanted to burn it down, but there were Christian houses nearby, so uh, they didn't do that. But everything was destroyed. Here's an actual picture of the inside of the synagogue. And actually, people were watching it, and they just, here, for instance, their little girl was watching it. And they destroyed the whole thing. Next. And I, um, I took this picture when I was first time back in Germany. Um, a part of the synagogue was still there, whatever they built. And this was a storage a a area for pig food. We do not eat uh, pig. We do not, just like the Muslims, they don't eat pork either, we don't. And at that time, and it, today it's been refurbished, yes, you can show it in the really beautiful, the way it was, and you have the Ten Commandments on top without any writing. It is a place, no longer of worship, but a cultural place, not only about Jewish things, other things, so that it's very active. And it was also the time where all the men from age 16 were sent to concentration camps. In our camp, first one actually, in Germany, as a regular prison, but later on it became mainly for the Jewish people. And my father, wait, my father and my grandfather were sent at that time to Dachau. My grandfather went into the uh, morning prayer, and my father came later, and they were all sent from the age of 16 on, and they were breaking our uh, windows. That's why it's called Crystal Night. Crystal, there was glass all over the floor, only for Jewish people. We were hiding in a backyard shed, and this went on for more than a day. I remember it, 
I was not even four years old, just before my fourth birthday. Remember it very well. And the men were gone. We didn't even know where they were sent. Luckily, a few weeks later, they were allowed to come home again. And my father never wanted to leave Germany. Uh, my grandparents were cattle dealers, small time. In the house, that's where they had it, the stable. And uh, we had an extra uh, place to go up to the living quarters. So anyway, my father never wanted to leave Germany. In fact, when we came here after the war, he felt kind of bad. He was out of, you know, he, he spoke English, but not the greatest. And so finally we decided to sell the house and moved in with my grandparents. And this is another smaller village where my grandparents came from and hoping to get the visa to come uh, to America. My mother already had um, a brother here. It's an interesting little village. This village was about a thousand people, Jewish people lived, we were about 40% of the village. That's very, not very common in Germany. Poland, yes, but not in Germany. And we had to live separate, by the way. By the way, go back to the other one because it's an interesting thing here. Uh, this was a Jewish section, but later on, we lived all together. We had a very good relationship. I had many children who played with me. I mean, they didn't uh, call me bad names. And when you look down the street, this was the Jewish section, but most of them left to go to America uh, in last century, 1850-ish, when the Germans came to America. In fact, we would have had German as the language, not English, I think a few votes were missing. Many Germans were in America. Now, when you look down on the left side, there was, you can't see it here, but there was a little bakery. That belonged to Albert Einstein's great-grandparents. So he must have walked the street too. Parents' house, the cows were here, the stable with the black door, that's my grandparents. We were very good citizens there. People were nice to us. We had a great relationship until all this terrible thing happened. Next. Next. Okay. Here was my best friend for life, my first ever girlfriend. She was not Jewish. They lived across the street. Her mother was my mother's best friend, and she became my best friend for the rest of her life. She died recently. And again, my doll, everybody knew Inga had a Marlene. Next. Uh, my grandfather died soon after we came um, back, uh, when they came back from Dachau, from a heart condition. And most of the monuments were stand-up monuments, but he, we gave him a lying down one because the cemeteries were being desecrated already there. Now, in the state of Baden, this was Württemberg. Today you have two states as one, Baden, Württemberg. No more separate. So, and they really didn't like each other, those two states. Still not. In 1940, in my hometown, Kippenheim, the uh, transports went to a camp called Gürz. Every Jew in that state was sent there, everyone. But we were no longer there. Uh, family would be support uh, the little girl watching and what is onlookers that's very important for us when things don't go well in this world don't just look do something the onlookers and here they were watching as these people were taken away within a half an hour or so to a camp in near France, in the Pyrenees there, in Spain. And uh, luckily some people survived, not many. They were taken from there uh, to Auschwitz mainly and killed. And this boy, did, uh, this is also a cousin of mine. It was a little village, a, a little bigger uh, Jeden house where my grandparents were, a, a thousand people. We were 2,000. 
here is one of my relatives. They gave them very little time, pack your bags uh, and, and go. Leave everything behind, next. Here are some of the people, the townspeople were watching. They were watching as the people were being deported. You even see a cow cultural place. Next. The name was Kippenheim. It's, you won't see too much on the map. But some pretty famous people came from there. Um, the the uh, songwriter and, and composer, Kurt Weil, uh, Mac the Knife. He went to America later on. He was born. I may not be born there, but his family lived there. And uh, the richest man in Israel for many years was born in the same place. He built a lot of little towns. He helped Gaza very much. He's 98 now, still alive. So here is uh, the people being deported. Very su a short time. And then I'm six years old. I need to go to school. But I had to go to a special what they call Drangsschule. You know, I had to go to a special school only for Jewish children. That was quite far away in Stuttgart. I had to take the train every train station and then go to the school. And here was the school. Uh, by the way, it was bombed eventually. And then stopped. I lost in my life eight years of schooling. Eight. And then came the time star here. I want to show it to you. I mean, you see it here, but to see it in person, I just pull it out. Here. You have to wear it. To walk around. My mother put uh, some uh, something to uh, that you could sew it on better. And I took that star off it. You taught in Dutch and Schrift in French. We had to and the star when I was liberated. I took it off. Next. And uh, here were st the trans and this was from 19. Um, the uh, in in that neighborhood, them, the families were sent to a place Riga in Latvia. My grandmother was in that one. And see the example here. All these children did not make it. They were probably shot in the mass grave, as was my grandmother and many other people. The one with the striped hat, that's me today. All these children. School closed um, soon after these deportations. Because Poland did it. It was really through Germany. And then our was the Roman numeral 13. The only people who could Theresienstadt and called in Czech terrorism in Czechoslovakia. At and uh, here's my actual papers, the first page, and my number is on it, 408. For my book, now we had to, I don't want to take too much time anyway, we had to leave everything on the table. Um, Then uh, we had to go to a school gym. Uh, looked at. Um, I was not going to give my dollar away. 
Dutch boy pin, but oh, by the way, that doll is in the museum in Washington. Displayed if she was. And then we landed up these are actually be there too. In fact, there's a, a that's where to it, but we were in the same place in Stuttgart. Lying on the floor, you could take some stuff with you which disappeared when we arrived. This actual picture. And then um, in the, we were there maybe two, three days until the trains come came. Now, we did not go in cattle car. Uh, the SS, the stormtroopers were riding with us. Next. We were 1,100 people in that transport and very, very few survived. Everybody in Germany had an ID, Ken Kaffee. And we had a J on it, Jew. And then they stamped on it, umgesiedelt, mean resettled. We didn't know where we were going to. My mother saved all these things. I'm very glad she did. Next. And we were in a train going to Terezin, which was a, actually an army garrison town built by Emperor Joseph II in memory of his mother, Mary, uh, Maria Teresa, in, in Czechoslovakia. And we had to walk, we had to leave everything behind. I made it quick, I know. Next. And we had to march into the camp and uh, I was dragging a little bag and the other stuff, they said, you'll get it later, never got it again. They were whipping us and uh, it was very scary for a little seven-year-old. I was there between seven and 10, next. Marching into the camp, somebody took these pictures uh, as we were marching by. Of course, it's not us, some other, I just got it out of a <clears throat> archive, next. And we arrive in this town, which was a small town, garrison town, with a lot of brick walls, totally uh, you know, separated from the other places. With, uh, it was with barbed wire, wall, wooden walls, and uh, also these t tremendous uh, red brick uh, walls and, and, uh, and houses you know, there. And this is one of the buildings, uh, what it looked like. When we arrived, we were sent to the attic. It was an even bigger one, the caserne, which means, caserne is in, in English, um, caserne. Barracks? <laughs> huh? Barracks? Well, there were barracks, but out of brick, brick, like for the soldiers, you know? Very bad condition. We pumped our water from these wells but the one we were in was even bigger, the Dresdner Kaserne. So it was totally separate from the outside world. No, no radio, no newspaper, nothing. Everything was taken from us. Next. We were 15,000 children there, and a very small percentage uh, you know, stayed alive. Uh, altogether, from 40, it started around 41, 40, 41, first came the Czechs and then Dutch and Germans from different countries. And um, we were about 140,000 altogether and almost everybody was sent to Auschwitz to be killed. Many people died there, over 30,000. Here's like the walls surrounding us. Next. And then right in the beginning, there was a, a scarlet fever epidemic and all of us had scarlet fever with two children in every bed, very, very crowded. Next. And here's a drawing, some, there were some really famous people there, the, the best musician, the best doctor, the best of everything that Europe had, but most of them were killed. Pumping water from a well. Uh, next, maybe two showers per year with permission. The women took the children, men set them. And this is, was taken by the Russians, which uh, liberated us. These beds that we slept in, this was taken at that time. Yes, next. 
And here, this is also taken by the Russians, how they saw the people there. Next. We were 15,000 children. Very few survived, very few. Maybe 10%, 1%, very few. Here's uh, some of these little wagons. They took the uh, <coughs> dead people to the crematory, had a big crematory. Or the bread ration, of course, I don't wanna go. You saw enough films, Schindler's List and all that, I'm sure you saw it, read enough books. Very poor nutrition, of course, people got sick. A lot of diseases, next. And here standing, there's an actual picture standing in line three times a day for your food. I don't wanna go into all that because we don't have the time. Very poor food, we got sick, malnutrition. Here, um, what was my playground? A garbage dump to find some potato peelings, uh, maybe uh, uh, whatever was there, uh, you know, some horse bones. We had no real meat, only slivers. And so that's what we were looking for. And my mother worked as a nurse, she never was before. And one morning she was working this with all these old ladies, most of them died. One of them felt something heavy on her shoulder. I said, what the heck is it? A rat, we had many rats, mice, fleas, bedbugs. I was a great flea catcher. <laughs> Next. The worst day I remember happened November 11th, 1943. Uh, they said they had to count us all. They knew there were at any time about 60,000 people there, 50,000, and we had to go to this ravine, stay all day. Probably they wanted to shoot us on that day, but they got orders from Berlin, let them all go back, and it was a terrible day. There was no real school, it was forbidden. But one friend of my mother's, she knew a little English, and she taught me a little poem, I wish I were a little bird up in the bright blue sky that sings and flies just where he will. No one asks him why. Now, the penmanship is pretty good. I only had six months of school, never finished my first grade, never. Next. And also they wanted to show it so everything is normal here, so they printed money, with which you could only buy some mustard, which made you even more hungry because there was an international Red Cross inspection once I'm very angry still today at the, uh, what they're doing now in the world. They're not helping people. They came to see it. They made a big theatrical production, uh, painted houses, put on signs on door, this is here. Children got uh, uh, sardine sandwiches and they took them away after they went. And they said, oh, it's pretty good here. They're okay. And only a few weeks later, every, almost everybody was sent to be killed, including my best friend. And here's the crematory, which is still there today. Four big ovens could be heated up right now and work, still working. And here is when the Russians came in on May 8th, 1945. And uh, I remember climbing up a wall, a wooden f wall there, a um, fence, and all of a sudden there was a big explosion. They were throwing in as they were running away, not the Russians, the Germans, you know, the guards and everything. And um, that was a hand grenade which went into a building very near us. Men, women, and children had to live separate, except the disabled war veteran. There were many from World War I patriots there. One had a shot in the head, still draining, a leg off, foot off and they, almost all of them were killed in 19, especially in 1944, after the International Red Cross came. And we shared a tiny room, uh, no heat in the room, in double-deck bunk beds with a family from Berlin that had a daughter named of Ruth. And I've been a few times back to Berlin and I visited, I don't know, are you familiar with Stolperstein, these stumbling blocks? She has one with her parents. And actually, her father was half Jewish, mother totally. She was the, uh, grown up, she was uh, brought up as a devout Christian. She died in Auschwitz before her 10th birthday. She would have been a wonderful artist. And every time I go there, even the president of the Bundestag, when I spoke there, she went with me to put flowers, white roses, on, on, the, on those stumbling blocks. And that was her, I, it was very hard to find anything on her. I put some 
uh, things on Facebook and so forth and uh, through uh, the internet and somebody had a picture of her. Maybe she was uh, maybe uh, three, four years old. That's the only thing left of her. And I met some of her family living in, uh, in Germany today. Next. After the war, I became very ill. I was already there. I had the disease called tuberculosis, which is very serious. Most people died, but thank God there was, I was two years first in the hospital and another two years home. I had to quit college, I was sick again, but there was a new drug that came out. I wrote, I met the man who discovered it. Nobel was given for it, but not to him, just the student, unfortunately. It was called streptomycin, one of the most important drugs <coughs> of the 20th century, last century. And here I'm in bed, yeah, and I guess that's the end. And I studied, I just the one second more, I became a chemist, I had a wonderful science. It, I tell you, teachers are very important. I dedicated my second book to my teachers, my first grade teacher uh, in the Jewish school, and uh, my science teacher, he was from my high school, I went to Bushwick High School in Brooklyn, in fact, I found out the new ambassador, uh, American ambassador to Germany, Amy Gutman, her mother went to the same school that I did in Brooklyn. And we had a meeting actually at the uh, Meta and a Facebook uh, building in Berlin and she came with students and I gave the presentation. Yeah, thank you so much. It's a little hard, you know, it's short, well, I can go on for hours, but anyway, <laughs> we don't have time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, okay, wait, let me get up. Well, thank you, Inga. I wanna make it easier for you. Don't have to hold this thing. But we can only we can move the move chair. The chair. Like no, 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 it's not easy. It's heavy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, good now. Perfect. Wonderful. Yeah. All right. Yes. All right. Thank you, Inga, so much Thank for your you. presentation. I think I can speak on everyone in the audience's behalf when I say how honored we are for your presence here today and for your brave willingness to relive such painful memories. Um, we are now Talk going a little louder. Talk louder. I am loud. Ich habe eine große Stimme. Now we're going to transition to okay. the Q&A portion. Yes. Um, so students and educators have submitted their questions in advance and we've Great. organized a list here to go through together. Uh, while there are many important and thoughtful questions that were submitted, we will unfortunately not have time to go through all of them. Um, so we have selected as broad a range of number as possible. <coughs> For the students who are here in person, I will call your name uh, and we will hand you your microphone to ask your question personally and for the students participating virtually, I will ask your question on your behalf. So okay. let's get started. Okay, shoot. <laughs> okay. Our first question comes from a student online and they would like to ask, is it hard to open up about the Holocaust and how do you feel when you talk about it? Well, I mean, even in high school, nobody knew my life story. Nobody knew. I, I, uh, at that time, I wasn't allowed to, to run around or something. Still was, I, I mean, I was negative already. It was actually my first time really to go to school at age 15. And I would hide. I would go to the elevator, which I was supposed to take. I didn't want anybody to know about me. Only lately, they found out, oh, we didn't know about your story. I said, no, you don't have to know my story. I'm just like you. But it is really important today to know that hatred, anti-Semitism especially, and especially now what's going on in the Middle East, um, I don't, you know, I don't hate them. The point is get to know other people. I mean, I've been to Afghanistan, Pakistan, I've, I've traveled all over, and you know, I remember sitting in a really dark area with a lady from Herat, Afghanistan. And I, we, didn't, we couldn't speak to each other. I showed her some pictures, my parents. We all have a mama and a papa. We're the same, important. And to me, 
As he said, yes, I've been to many mosques. My next door neighbors are uh, devout Muslims, and the other devout Hindus. And we share, we share. Um, I feel it's my obligation to speak for the one and a half million Jewish children who were murdered, slaughtered is a bad word. And I, I, I usually wear a butterfly, but here I have a pin. There was one boy in Terrison who wrote a poem called, <clears throat> I Never Saw Another Butterfly. And the butterfly became the symbol of the one and a half million Jewish children who were murdered. It's important for me, as long as I'm alive, <clears throat> that butterfly shall fly again. They cannot be forgotten. And, and look, it's, I hate wars. In fact, I have a new song, A World of Peace, um, which was sung in many different places. I, I, the only thing I could do when I was in bed for four years is to write. And uh, we had a wonderful teacher, I so appreciate your teachers. You can be whatever you want to be. Have big dreams. I always thought, I want to be a movie star. Well, I didn't want to be a movie star. I'm not a star. I'm a fallen star, really. <clears throat> but dream big and be happy who you are. Learn from other people. It's very important. And that's why I travel the world, to see other people. How do they pray? How do they eat? What they eat? What, what kind of family life they have? We, look, we, like he said, if what I said in the Bundestag in my speech, look, we're all children of God. I mean, you don't have to be religious to know that. It's just, we have to, now this whole thing in Israel and Pakistan, uh, and Gaza, and it, it, it just blows my mind. And all the other countries who are having problems similar to that, why can't we all live together? like I do in my little place in Jamaica, Queens. In fact, they're planning, if it works out, they might name that street, that block, <clears throat> after me. And that would be my greatest thing in whatever, I, all the speeches and everything has mean nothing when we get people together. We're the same. Blood is red. Thank so you. it's very important as long as I can I will try to get people together, not with hate, with reconciliation, with love. Thank you, Inga. It's a very powerful message. Our next question comes from a student here in the audience. Neil, if you'd like to raise your hand, we'll pass you a microphone for you to ask your question. Yeah, yeah, I know. Oh, oh. <laughs> Uh, what were moments of hope in the concentration? Well, there wasn't much hope, but my father was always a hopeful person, not my mother. When we were standing there, probably ready to be shot, he told my mother, we're going to ride in the car again. And that was a big deal for my mom, because when her fiancé came, he came in a car. At that time, almost nobody had a car. And here's the guy coming with the car. Oh my God, I think she married the car. <laughs> and, but they were married 54 years until he died. And uh, he gave, he said, don't worry, you're gonna ride in the car again. I mean, they were, they was, we were surrounded by guys with guns. He said, oh my God, we're not gonna make it. We made it. I'm also a very positive person. Um, you know, even, when things go bad, I always have plan B. Have plan B. Hope, there was not much hope. We did not know about Auschwitz. The people just disappeared. And I know my girlfriend, when she was on the transport, she gave me a, in fact, the picture is on my new book here. She uh, had got a little bit, she had the same doll. That was very important to us to keep that. And she had a hat that she gave for her doll. Somebody gave it to her. And before she went to Auschwitz, she said, oh, look, I'm going to give it to you for safekeeping. One day you'll come to Berlin, which I did. 
And then um, I come to Kippenheim or Jedenhausen, where my grandparents lived. You, you had to, you know, you have to think, you make your own hope. As long as you woke up in the morning, you're still alive. And it's got to be better. It's got to get better. My father was the one who gave us hope, I will say that. It looked pretty bleak. Okay. Our next question is from a student participating virtually, and they would like to know, did you and do you still... Loud, loud. Did you and do you still continue to face anti-Semitism after immigrating to America? Am I don't understand. Did you and do you still continue to face anti-Semitism after immigrating to America? Yeah. Well, I didn't feel it here. I will say that. I never experienced it here. But my first trip back, well, actually, I wanted to study medicine, and I was a little older. Already, I was 31 when I, I was healthy enough, and I said, I want to do it. And I got in in the best medical school in Germany, Heidelberg. Oh, you know, it was amazing to get in there. And then I heard, at night, I had a room already in Wiebling and very near Heidelberg, and I heard Nazi songs being sung. I remember those. Kameraden und Gemossen marschieren auch in unseren Reihen mit. I said, what the heck is going on here? It was the first of May, and they, you know, people get drunk and they have marches, but I didn't expect that, and that was in 1968. And then I couldn't take it, and I resigned, although I had made some friends, a professor in, uh, who was teaching in the medical school there, he says, no, you're gonna stay here. And I regretted it. In that moment, I couldn't do it. I mean, that was, and now when I hear all these things going on, I, of course, it brings back memories. It does, you know? In fact, I have a friend, she said, why don't you come back? I wasn't even thinking. I do not have the German citizenship yet. I don't know if I will take it or not. The question is open, mit Fragezeichen. I mean, it was taken away be, maybe when I was one year old. And um, I don't know, I'm an American citizen now and that's it. I feel American, but there's a lot of German in me yet. Oh my God. I had a very tough German daddy and he brought me up very tough. We still spoke German at home. I know all the songs. Auf der Schwäbische Eisenbahn gibt's gar viele Haltestationen. That's a very famous one in Swabian. I know all those things. I'm not a person who hates. And I was very grateful that to be able to speak at really the highest, to me it was the high point of my life, to be in the parliament in, in Germany. Me, my father would come up from the gate. What, you spoke there? Oh my God, you know. But I don't know, you know, I think there's too much hate in the world, uh, everywhere. Everywhere, in Africa, everywhere. I have black friends, but unfortunately my friend died. Um, I have friends of all different denominations, good friends, even better than my, Jer my Jewish friends, I will say, who stood by me when I buried my mother, my African-American friend. She was there, it was icy snow, and my people from the block the Indian family, I'm very close with it. They helped me stay there because I have no relatives. One second cousin I found. So that's it, you know. But uh, the opportunity is there to study and to make something of yourself, whatever you want. Now all, all these computers, that's a new thing. <laughs> yeah. I wish you good luck. Whatever you dream about, every, anything you want to do, and do it, do it. We have one more question from our in-person audience, from Sophie. Uh, would you like to raise your hand, Sophie, from Stuyvesant? Yes, we will pass you a mic in your question. Yes. Um, were there difficulties that you experienced trying to integrate in society again after the Holocaust, or like was there help along the way? 
I, d I didn't quite get it. Maybe you'll repeat it. Yeah, would you like to repeat it? Sure. Uh, were there difficulties that you experienced trying to integrate in society again after the Holocaust, and was there help along the way? Yeah. Yes, it was difficult. Even the memories go back to today. I was a piece of garbage for the world, especially over there. And, you know, I felt this insecurity. Nobody will love me. Nobody will be nice to me. And um, I will say there were few heroes in my life. One was when I went to school, my father always said, my parents had to work for a very, very that time. I went all by myself, six years old. He said, you had to wear the star. Everybody knew. She's different. She's a piece of garbage. And you begin to feel that way. You really do. And he said, oh, well, sit near the window. You can cover. Lean against the left window. And I remember one lady was in, uh, walking near me as she went out the car, not Jewish because she didn't wear a star. And uh, she brought a little brown paper bag, put it next to me, and left. There were some rolls in it. And probably she, that was her lunch. I never forgot her. No name. She wanted to do something for that child, not to be a bystander. And that was the problem, too. And even all these years to today, I have to prove myself that I can do something. I've, my father said, are you the best in the class? I said, not always. He said, well, you better be. <laughs> we expect that out of you. And well, that's the German way. And um, it's um, my whole life, you know, I, I strive to be somebody. It, it, even to today, you know, to get to be a speaker in the United Nations. I never dreamed that I could do it. Never dreamed. Or to be in the Bundestag, oh my God, not me. And then the, the speech went all over Germany and uh, every newspaper wanted to have what I think and this and that. Yes, it follows me to this day. I have to prove to myself that I'm still somebody. And I gotta do this and that. I gotta have a book published here, I have six so far. And uh, you've got to prove to yourself you're somebody. Now, growing up in a normal way, you might not have that problem. Maybe if you have a bullies and treating you bad, hopefully not. But I've been trying to prove myself my whole life. It never went away that I was segregated. I used to look in the mirror. You look like everybody else. So why are they hating you? Well, you got to get over that, of course, but it never really leaves you, not me. Proving always you got to do this, you got to do the impossible, you know, you got to do it. Hopefully it works. And that's, and teachers have a lot to do with that too. They're very important in your, my second book I dedicated to of my teachers, who had a tremendous uh, influence on me. I never had any science. When in the hospital, we had no school. Yeah, we, they showed us once a flower, we put it in the dark and the, and the uh, flower died, no sunlight. And the other one was in the sunlight, it lived. That was my initiation to science. Then I had a fantastic teacher in science. I said, you know, I like this. I used to go home and do the experiments at home. I remember testing for starch. I was a big black blot uh, on, on our tablecloths, we, I, I, the money was very scarce. And I said, my father will kill me now. But I tried all this stuff at home, and I loved it, and I was good in it. So that's how I got into science. Never thought I would do that. Yeah, I want to be an actress, <laughs> <laughs> as every little girl. Movie star, of course. That didn't happen, that's okay. Well, thank you, Inga. Uh, I think that's all the time we have for questions today. Okay. Um, so I would just like to say on behalf of our educational network of students and teachers of German who are here today both in person and joining virtually um, around the country, thank you so much for being thank here you. today. And hearing your story, I hope we are all able to reflect on very real realities of the human experience 
Moreover, I hope that your story will serve as a catalyst for transformative learning, uh, inspiring us to institute crucial changes in our societies, thereby contributing to the creation of a more peaceful world um, for future generations to come. I'd also like to once again thank all of our colleagues from StoryFile and Meta, as well as our GoTo team, without whom this event would not have been possible. To our online audience, please visit our website and subscribe to our newsletter to stay up to date on our upcoming workshops, trainings, and events. Most notably, this was the first event in our new educational training series um, on how to implement topics and themes of anti-discrimination into the classroom. Our next event in the series will be a German teacher workshop offered by our German educational multipliers on how to implement Inga Auerbacher's story into the German classroom using a self-developed Uhebschen. Uh, I will send out a follow-up email to everyone who registered with all of the necessary information to learn more and follow along uh, in this series. Thank you for joining us and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Can I say one more thing? I would like just to, before we end, remember each and one of you is a star. You have something special. Everybody has something special. Don't be a hateful person. Learn about other people. It's very, very, very important. And not to go on these stupid marches just because, you know, to have wrong information. Think about it. We are all human beings. And it's so important uh, to love thy neighbor, which, uh, who is Christian, Jesus said that. Love thy neighbor. Yeah, very important. So when you go out, you can all say, I am a star, and you are. One, two, three, I wanna hear it. I'm a special person. Yeah, well, go ahead, I wanna hear it. I'm a star. I'm a star. Together, loud. Ich bin ein Stern in German. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank I you. I wish you good luck, whatever you want. Thank you. Okay, so for our in-person guests, we would like to do a group picture with everyone. Um, so for that, I think I'll ask for some help uh, with Inga I to get her down. back down. Yeah, I think okay. we'll do it from this way so everyone can stay seated. Uh, I think it'll be easiest to catch us all this way. Don't get this. <laughs>